The following is a Metro TV special presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. We want to um, welcome you out today to this community conversation with Dr. George C. Wright, hosted by Councilwoman Sherry Brown Hamilton. We want to thank each and every one of you uh, for taking time on this rainy day to fight through the water and the flood to get here. My name is Stephen Smith, pastor here at Portland Baptist Church, and we um, open our doors and welcome you into this conversation so that we may uh, learn and grow and assess what it is we need to do to move life forward. So at this time, I'm going to ask Councilwoman Hamilton if she would come, because evidently she must have sung in the uh, fifth choir. <laughs> to lead us in a song. Well, actually, I'm going to have Reverend Donna, Donna Adams to come and lead us in. Lift every voice and sing. If you don't know, we're going to sing all three verses. Lift every voice and sing. Till earth and heaven bring, bring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sing. Sing a song full of the faith that the blessing has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is one stony the road we trod bitter the chesting rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our Father's side. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path in the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who had brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has been thy might, let us into the light. Keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stay from the places our God were we met thee. Lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee. Shadowed by Bless you. Now that's how you kick off a Black History Month celebration. 
I want to thank everyone for braving the weather and coming out today. Um, you could have been anywhere else, but you chose to be here for this occasion, and I'm so appreciative. I want to thank Pastor Smith and Portland Memorial Missionary Baptist Church for opening their doors to us this afternoon. Ron, you did a great job. Mr. Norfleet, Ms. Donna Adams, thank you, Reverend. Um, I know you don't want to hear from me, but I would like to acknowledge my uh, colleagues who are here. Councilwoman Mary Woolridge, Councilman David James, Councilman Bill Hollander. I want to thank you all for your support. And he's got an event coming up next week at uh, United Crescent Hill with Josh Poe talking about redlining. I saw on Wednesday the 28th at 6.30. So if you can uh, put that on your calendar to, to make that as well. Uh, last November, I was doing a little research because we're going to have a historical marker for the old Red Cross Hospital where many of us were born, our, our fathers practiced, our, we were patients, or we worked there. And uh, Red Cross has a special meaning in my heart. So some of you got a flyer that we had in the back and we hope that you'll show up April the 10th at 11 a.m. for the dedication of that historical marker. But at the same time, we were also doing a historical marker for uh, the Buchanan v. Worley case. And I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know much about the case. Uh, Portland, uh, Portland um, what's the name of the place? Anyway, they asked me to uh, sponsor a marker, and I was glad to do that. But I started doing research about the case. And uh, come to find out, every source I went to quoted Dr. Wright and Life Behind a Veil whether it was talking about Red Cross or whether it was talking about this Buchanan v. Worley residential segregation case, George C. Wright, Life Behind a Veil, George C. Wright, A History of Kentucky. And I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I said, this seems like the man, you know. And so I, I went on Amazon and I ordered Life Behind a Veil. I couldn't find out the book had been published in 1985. And... Uh, I didn't know whether he was alive or dead, whether he was black or white, who he was. But I said, I've got to meet, uh, or, you know, I've got to make a connection here. So anyway, I read the book, came off social media for a while. It was taking too much time. And I, I read his book, uh, and then I got so moved, uh, I ordered about two or three more books for Christmas presents. You know, I said, everybody, you've got to read this book. You've got to read this book. So I've kind of been on a mission to get people to read this book. And then uh, last couple of weeks ago, Empower West had um, a citywide read on the color of law, uh, Richard Rusting's book. So between Life Behind a Veil and the Color of Law, these are my two favorite books that everybody in this community needs to read to understand the history of this community. And then go on Wednesday to hear Josh Poe. Uh, it's all about knowing where, we, where we've come from and how we're tied together in this community history of Louisville because we know um, black history or African-American history is uh, Louisville history. It's Kentucky history. It's United States history. And a lot of it has been left out and has been not taught. So Chase in my office, we said, let's Google him. So we Googled uh, Dr. Wright, found out that he was in Texas, and uh, that he was a native of, Lew of Lexington, Kentucky. I said, oh, well, he's a homeboy. I said, maybe we have a, a, a leg up. These are the students from Mercy Academy. Come on in and, and just find a seat. We're glad you're here. And thanks, Councilman Kramer, for arranging you all to be here. Um, so anyway, um, I saw George uh, Brown and J.T. Woods at an event, and I was telling them about the book. Well, they must have ordered the book because they started talking about it on their radio show, and they were telling everybody to get Life Behind a Veil. And so we were starting another read going on. And um, I'm just so happy that he's here because in his book he talks about uh, polite racism. You know, Louisville, we think we're one way and we've got this one history going on and he's talked about the monuments and he's talked about the whole history. And I was like, wow, can you come to Louisville? He said, well, I'm gonna be in Lexington next weekend. And I said, well, can you fit us in? You know, so he's got a, 
a couple hours this afternoon where he could be here in Louisville. So we're so happy to, to have him here today. I have given you all at the back a copy of his bio uh, so you can read. I just wanted to say that after he graduated and got his master's from um, UK, he got his doctorate from Duke University. And he's for 13 years, I believe, he was president of Prairie View a and in uh, Texas and uh, just retired in September, but he's still full-time faculty and teaching. So I've got a handheld mic here for him because I know professors don't stand behind a podium. They move and groove. I'd also like to thank uh, Councilwoman Barbara Sexton Smith for being here and thank all of you for coming. We do have Metro TV who is taping this today, so it will be uh, shown at a later date. We've got Clinton Bennett's uh, company here, Studio West, who is recording it, and also uh, Dr. Wright's cousin, Gwen Blackburn, is also videotaping. So if you contact my office, we can help you if you want to get a copy of today's presentation for later uh, at a cost of $10. Uh, we'll make that available to you. But without further ado, I'd like to present to you Dr. George C. Wright. Afternoon. Let's see. Can you hear me okay with this one? Uh, let's see. Good afternoon. This one's okay. Let me. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me okay. I hope. In fact, I hope I'm not too loud uh, in that regard. I have to tell you, I am overwhelmed by being here this afternoon and the range of the audience. A lot of times I speak to high school students, uh, a lot of times I speak to adult audiences, uh, but I'm so happy to be here. And I, and Please forgive me, like a lot of people, one of the things about aging is that something changes, and in my case, it's my eyesight. I can't see nearly as well, and especially out of my left eye, but I just noticed my sister Amanda's over there. Stand up, Amanda. This is my baby sister. Boy, it would have been horrible if I didn't recognize my baby sister here. And then my first cousin, Gwen, uh, my mother had three sisters. Her, roughly her same age, who lived in Louisville. So I've got a ton of cousins in Louisville. But as was mentioned, my cousin Gwen Blackburn is here as well. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. And one of my colleagues from graduate school who is a lifelong friend. If you ever want to know where I am or if you ever want to know where Terry is, all you have to do is contact one of the other. Terry Birdwiss and I met in graduate school at UK, and we have been to all 120 counties in Kentucky together. We've been abroad together. We've been all over the United States together and so forth. And in fact, when we used to go into places, we'd be dressed kind of like this, and they would say, that's the uh, internal revenue service or something. I don't know who they thought we were. Uh, but I'm very, very happy to have this opportunity, and I'm going to try to do several different things. Hopefully, I can pull it off. If not, we'll have a question and answer period, and you can ask me about anything. But I want to start off by talking about why Black History Month is significant, or to ask it another way, is Black History Month still important? I want to do that. Then I was going to make a comment or two about myself as a way of transitioning to talking about my scholarship on race in Kentucky, and then I was going to try to tie those two back together into uh, making a wrap-up about black history again in Kentucky. Uh, as all of you surely know, that February has been designated since 1915. First, it was what? Negro History Hour, then Negro History Day, then Negro History Week, Negro History Month. Uh, then eventually came Black History Month. Uh, in that regard, this started in 1915. Now, I have been fortunate enough to attend black history programs for most of my life, as have a number of you. And I'm always excited about it, but I have begun to notice that some people don't seem to understand the continued significance of Black History Month. I've had some people to start off by saying sarcastically, if it was so important, it would not be relegated to one month only, and then they say the shortest month of the year. In that regard, I've had some well-meaning whites, and I really mean that, who have said to me, when is White History Month? since they're Black History Month, 
And I've said, well, think about it. Black History Month in February, Women's History Month, Mexican American History Month, Asian History Month, four months, the other eight months, White History Month. They just don't call it that. I'm okay with that in that regard. But Black History Month is important. Some people, white and black, has said, but sometimes in the focus on African Americans, can't it backfire and not be what it was meant to be? So my question, is African History Month still important and necessary? My response is, unequivocally, it is. It's so important that we look back and we also look at where we are today. Uh, I'm in church, and uh, is, is the minister still here? Because I was going to quote a scripture, and you know, I'm not a minister, so I might mess it up. So uh, Isaiah 51, verse 1, gives us a reason why we need to do this. Isaiah 51, verse 1, hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock from whence ye were hewn, and the hole of the pit from whence ye were digged. That scripture says all of us need to look unto the rock from which we came from. All of us need to know our past to help us to understand the world in which we live in. When Negro History Day started in 1915, it clearly was one of the worst periods of race relations in the United States. Now think about that. If you think about slavery, then how can a period be worse than slavery? Well, in 1915 America, north, south, border states like Kentucky, segregation existed to the extent of white people's imagination. Think about that. There were some places in the South that when white people swore an oath before testifying, they swore on white Bibles. In that same courthouse, a black person would swear on a black Bible. Of course, the schools, the parks, the this and that were segregated. Every other day in America, for 50 years on average, a black person was lynched by a mob in America during those years. The racism extended to the White House during those years under Presidents Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and above all, Woodrow Wilson, who instituted racial segregation in virtually every area of the federal government. When I started the graduate program in history at UK, I took a Southern history class to try to understand race relations. We read a book called The Negro A Beast that was published on another one, The Negro, A Menace to American Society. A third book written by a man named Madison Grant, a well-known sociologist, was called The Passing of the Great Race. And it said if America did not do something to end its Negro population, they would dilute the white race. America, fortunately, did not follow up on Madison Grant's idea, but guess what? Some eugenics professors in Germany tried to institute some of the ideas of Madison Grant. So it's against this backdrop that Carter G. Woodson, W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary Church Terrell, uh, Mary McLeod Methune, um, Ida Wells Barnett, and others worked to try to promote a different image of African Americans. I could spend the rest of the afternoon, of course, talking about a lot of them, but I want to make a reference point or two to one or two of them. Number one, William Edward Burkhart Du Bois, born 1868, died 1963, the same day as the March on Washington. Throughout his 95 years of life, he would author The Souls of Black Folk, one of the 
most important books written on race relations in the United States. A lot of people forget that he did a sociological works on Philadelphia and the Atlanta University series, but a number of people don't realize that in 1898, Du Bois goes to the U.S. Congress and receives an appropriation of $25,000 that would be used for something called the Negro exhibit in the 1900 Paris France World's Fair. In that exhibit, Du Bois talked about the progress of the American Negro since emancipation. Tried to show how many schools were started, how many businesses, how many farmers exist and the like. One of the reasons why I wanted to mention him today is that February the 23rd, today, is his birthday. Du Bois would be 150 years old today, and guess what? February the 23rd, today, is my birthday in that regard. Now, guess what I tell folk? I tell folk that my mother was in labor and was about to have me on February 22nd, but she waited until the 23rd Du Bois Day. That's not true. But nevertheless, I was amazed when I found out I was born on Du Bois Day. So that's one of the people. And of course, we know Carter G. Woodson and the numerous things he did. He promoted a very positive and different view of the continent of Africa. He also, in all of his presentations, would talk about the contributions of the Negro, that was the word back then, in all of America's wars. He talked about how blacks participated in the American Revolutionary War. Some people forget that blacks fought on both sides in the American Revolutionary War, right? And when the British lost, you all remember this, that they took some 12,000 blacks that the founding fathers wanted to re-enslave with them to Canada, Canada and the West Indies. So ironically, the British, the losers, really promoted black freedom at the end of the American Revolutionary War. But nevertheless, blacks fought in the American Revolutionary War, War of 1812, above all, the American Civil War. In the American Civil War, one out of every 12 whites who fought died, extraordinarily high number, one out of every three black men who fought died an unbelievable number at that time. A Carter G. Woodson did that. When the song, the National Negro Anthem, was played a few minutes ago, it always brings back something in me. Like a number of you, I, I look around this room, most of you all are younger than me, I understand that, but there are some folk like me. I started kindergarten 1955. These folks say, how can anybody start kindergarten in 1955 and be alive today? I mean, that guy must be what? What is his age? My goodness. And I remember in the 1950s just being glad to be out of class, to be in a program like that. So I just sat there. I was cool. At some point, however, my teachers made me learn some poems for Black History Month. I didn't like that. Even worse, they made me learn the song. I'm always amazed when they start singing the National Negro Anthem, and I'll look, and there are folk my age who are reading the words. They made me learn every word of that song, and that's something that's buried deeply in me, and we had to give speeches for that. It's from that experience that would open up a door so wide into my life. I'm in the fourth grade. I was cutting up. Now, my sister and my cousin would say, what's new about that? If he gets out of here without cutting up today, it'll be about the first time. Okay. In any event, I did not get to go outside during recess. They said I had to go to the library as a punishment. Check that out. As a punishment, I'm in the library bored and mad, but after sitting there for 10 minutes, I started thumbing through a book. And it was a book that had an illustrations of slavery in it. 
And I came upon an illustration, not a, a portrait, an illustration of a woman that had chains all over her, including a mask chain, like a muzzle that you'd put on a dog. That was ingrained in me. Three years ago, my wife and I were in the Afro-Brazil Museum in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I see this huge picture, probably that size, of that woman, and I said, oh, my goodness. I saw that as a fifth grader back in the 1960s, but that would open up reading for me. I brought along copies of my two reading lists. That one of the most important things that Black History Month did for me was to unlock the concept of reading, which has become the main thing in my life. Okay. I now want to briefly shift, hope I've shown you, and I'll come back to make some conclusions about Black History Month, but the councilwoman had asked me to talk about my scholarship on race in Kentucky. Okay. I grew up in Lexington, not Louisville, but if you grew up in Lexington, you also came to Louisville, or what happened in Lexington pretty much was happening in Louisville back then. My father, the man who became my father-in-law, as well as your relatives as well, both my father, my father-in-law, were drafted into World War II. They come back to Lexington, they could have come back to Louisville after the war, and they would not have been able to use the bathrooms in downtown Louisville, they could not. Interestingly enough, if they had been a German prisoner of war who had been in jail here in Kentucky and then free, they could use the bathrooms, but a black person who fought in the war could not. Because I've always been something of a smart aleck, my mother would say to me, don't say that again, but I would do it anyway. We'd be downtown Lexington and I would say to her, mama, what do white people do in bathrooms that we don't do? Right, what do they do? I want to go in there and see what's going on. Uh, we could not eat even in the 10 cent stores. To this day, if we were home tonight in Texas, my wife and I would go out to dinner and she would say to me, go ahead and say it, cause you always say it. Think about this. My wife and I, we could be out for dinner in Lexington, Louisville tonight, and all we would do is eat. But what then was the big deal on not allowing us to eat in the restaurant? So I would say to my wife, what did they think we were going to do in here but eat in that regard? Growing up in Lexington slash growing up in Louisville, Louisville had an amusement park. Lexington called it Jolin Amusement Park. We could go to Jolin Amusement Park twice each summer on designated Negro Day. And guess what? We went on Negro Day in that regard. Can you imagine now? If they said it's Negro Day, I wouldn't go. If they said Women's Day only, I wouldn't go then. Gay Day, wouldn't go then. And on down the line. But I look forward uh, to going back then. But think about this last one, and I could give you a lot of others. I love to read. The first time I went into the Lexington Public Library, I was 12 years old. Up until then, I thought going to the library meant getting into a bookmobile in that regard. Well, those were some of my experiences as a young person. Uh, and once I started college at the University of Kentucky, I took a course in Kentucky history as well as courses in Southern history, and they made comments that Kentucky was different than the rest of the places where black people had been enslaved. They said the Kentucky slave owners were kinder than everyone else. And I, so I said, wait a minute, let me get this straight. I guess that meant that they wore their, slave, their chains loosely or something like that. I was trying to understand that. But then I said, but aren't they failing to tell us something that I would talk about my research? Think about this. Of all the places in America, in the United States, the last place that slavery existed was where? Kentucky. 
right? The Civil War started. Right. There were four slave states that remained in the Union. Maryland, Missouri, Delaware, Kentucky. Maryland and Missouri pretty much ended slavery. Delaware had so few number of slaves that most of them could ran away. Kentucky had over 200,000 slaves when the Civil War breaks out. Some of them gained their freedom by their fathers fighting on the Union side. But the Civil War ends, and there's 100,000 people enslaved in Kentucky, not Alabama, Georgia, and others, because the Emancipation Proclamation had, had finished, had freed them. So think about it. The 13th Amendment, if you want to be most technical, applied to Kentucky because everywhere else it freed their slaves. The Kentucky legislature voted against the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment for citizenship, the 15th Amendment for uh, voting rights. It would be in my lifetime, Senator Neal, that the Kentucky legislature in the 1970s would look back and say, we need to have another vote on the 13th. 14th and 15th Amendment, and then they voted the way to end those things. But of course, it was already in effect because of the other state. So in understanding that, I decided to do research. I would publish, and you know what? Uh, Councilwoman Hamilton has sold more copies of my book in the last 30 months than have been sold in 30 years. Man, I'm indebted to this. Uh, I would write the book on race relations in Louisville. But I think there are two things to keep in mind. One, I do talk about and try to document the racial discrimination, the racial segregation, the racial struggle, but I also talk about the community life that, back, that black people made behind, i.e., behind the walls, behind the veil. And they talk about the rich community life here Every organization you can possibly think of. Uh, they had the Freemasons, they had all that. They even had the uh, odd community of Masons and all of these kinds of things. They had welfare societies. There were so many different churches. At one point, there are two banks owned by African Americans here and so forth, insurance companies and the like. And that Louisville would have a thriving black community, so much so that people forget that a lot of times in the 1960s when someone black was appointed or elected to a position here in Louisville, they would say he or she is the first, what they should have said, he or she was the first in 50 years into that position, that Louisville had those positions and things as part of that. Uh, while doing research on Louisville, I came across some horrendous examples of racial atrocities, not so much here in Louisville, but throughout the state of Kentucky, and that led to my book on racial violence in Kentucky. Uh, I'm not here today to try to say things that are so horrendous to folk, but I can give you examples of here in Kentucky where people were burned at the stake. Uh, and this would be announced in the newspaper in advance, and so a community of 1,000 people would swell to 20,000. I talk about one episode in northern Kentucky where an older person in a wheelchair goes to all this trouble to come all the way up there to add to the burning fire. I can show you from my book pictures of where folk would have their children just gazing up if, that, if they told me someone was going to be lynched outside of this church here today, you could bet that George Wright would not be there in that regard. Well, people do. So I talk about lynchings. But in some ways, and I know it's relative, I talk about something called legal lynchings. There were trials in Kentucky, hundreds of them, where a black peace person would go into court the evidence would be heard, a jury sworn in, the evidence heard, the jury deliberation, and the execution in two hours, and things like that. Over, and, the, and the person would be told, you better plead guilty. And you say, wait a minute, if, you, if I plead guilty, you're going to hang me. 
If you don't plead guilty, we're going to cut off all your fingers and burn you in that regard. Which way would you prefer it? You plead guilty. If you think I'm making this up, all you have to do, go to the Courier Journal, go to various government records, and the like. The third aspect that I talk about in Kentucky is instances in Kentucky of where there were black people who lived in places, let's say as late as 1900, and they were forced to leave their communities, leaving their properties behind. Or think about it like this. In 1860, black people probably lived in every county in Kentucky. You look at a map of Kentucky by 1920, and there are some counties where nobody black lived. There were certain places that you could not live in if you were black in Kentucky. So this is what my book on racial violence talked about. Not a pleasant subject. My third book would be In Pursuit of Equality, where I talk about a group of whites, notice I said whites, and blacks coming together to form the NAACP uh, core of other organizations that would start pushing in the early 1900s. Many people will take the Brown decision of 1954 as the culmination, and that's appropriate, but what they forget is that it took 30 years to get to the Brown decision. It took that long for all of the civil rights issues to, per to percolate and to end in success. So my third book does that. Now, after writing the three books on race in Kentucky, I decided several things. Number one, I needed to look at race in a larger context than just Kentucky because I was afraid after writing those books, somebody would say George Wright is saying that white people are vicious and black people are villains. I was not saying that. What I was saying is that when one group of people have all of the power, they can corrupt. To prove that, I decided to start doing research in places outside of Kentucky and outside of the United States. Beginning in the 1980s, really about 1990, my wife and I, every summer for about 10 years, we went someplace in Europe, primarily Eastern Europe, starting in Germany and then going systematically through concentration camps in various places, culminating by going through Auschwitz and Treblinka uh, in Poland. After that, we decided to go to Australia because we wanted to see what happened to the people there. Very fascinating. The Australian government did something that the United States government has failed to do. They issued an apology to the Aborigine people in March 2008. After spending time there, we then went to South Africa. And as you know, South Africa has had its reconciliation councils where people have come forward to try to mend relationships there. And we're saved for last going to Brazil, uh, that we've been to Brazil twice. We're going to Brazil in March again to try to understand race relations there, to put what I learned in Kentucky into a larger context. The second thing, ironically, after writing the books on race relations in Kentucky, I tell audiences like you that if you read my books carefully, you will ultimately say that while we might not have total equality in the United States, in Lexington and Louisville today, we've made significant progress along the way. Did you check that out? That if you look at the way things were in 1915, when a black person could be killed at any whim of a white person, and so on, we have made progress. If you take any marking point and look at today, and that's even understanding the atrocities and the things that upset all of us that still happen in our society today. What that says to me 
is that if the racism and the problems that our grandparents encountered have changed, then we too can make changes in the world we live in. Our world is not perfect, but our world has improved. I said my final point. I'm in a Baptist church, and one of the things I like to tell folk, uh, I've grown up Baptist all my life, and when the minister says, and I conclude, that doesn't really mean they conclude. That just, no. That's just one conclusion of several. So, but this time, I am going to conclude. Let me give you a final point for Black History Month. Actually, two final points. Okay, you see. One, Black History Month has got to be the time, if no other time, where we talk to people across racial lines and that we listen to folk. I, I am saddened by the fact that I live in an America today where people don't listen, don't care about the ideas. Of, it doesn't bother me that people don't always agree with me. I've been married to the same woman since I was a sophomore in college, and she rarely, if ever, agrees with me. So the, that is not necessary. But we listen and we respect. I don't believe I've ever called someone in the context of a, of a conversation a racist or any name that would be designed for me to put them down. And I've been in many conversations where people don't agree with me. I love Terry Bird Whistle. We've been everywhere. We've argued all sorts of things. He's been wrong more times than right, but I listen to him anyway. Right on? In that regard, why can't we listen to other people? Why can't we acknowledge at times when they are right? Then my truly last point, I'm going to do it by way of a story. 1946 December. Branch Rickey, the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, made the decision that the colored boy, I'm just using the terms they were using, right on? Jackie Robinson was coming up to the major league team. He meets with the staff. One person in particular is offended. The announcer for the games, a man named Red Barber. Red Barber storms out of the meeting. And he goes home and says to his wife, I can't believe this. They're going to bring up this colored boy on our team. I can't call the games. I'm going to quit. His wife looked at him and said, it's December. The season doesn't start until April. Why don't you think about it? Red Barber said, I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it. And I came to the conclusion that Jackie Robinson did not have anything to do with himself being black. I didn't have anything to do with myself being white. Why do I think my race is some kind of virtue and his is not? Why can't I say whatever race I am, that was by chance in that regard? So here I am a person who has done black history all of his adult life saying, don't make too much out of your race. Why not be accepting of the race that you are? But why not embrace everybody else's race or differences? And I'm not making this up just because I live in a more diverse world, but one of the things that has been consistent with me all my life is when somebody told me that somebody was, quote, different, and they meant it in a pejorative way, I thought that was good. But if they said, don't mess with him or her because they're different, I ran over there because I wanted to find out about it. And my travels around the world have convinced me folk are not different than me. That I say to you, we've got to find a way to, to accept who we are, but find the humanity in all of us. I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. It's so enlightening. I, I know a couple of your friends came in. Uh, Tom Owen. Uh, now, Tom, when I opened this first book on the first page under the acknowledgments, his name is there because when he was here in Louisville doing his research, 
Tom offered him a space at the... And we had been in graduate courses at UK together many years ago. Terry, Tom, and I, we were all in graduate school many years ago. So now's the community conversation part. Here's the questions, the conversation. Who wants... I gotta, I'm gonna do the Oprah. So who, who wants to be first? Got a question, a comment? Uh, anybody? Yeah, and it can be a comment as much as a question, uh, or, or any, and it doesn't. And other people can feel free to answer it as well. I'll do my best, but yeah. Uh, my question has to do with our current emphasis on STEM in terms of technology, undermining academic studies in terms of research. That it seems we're shifting more to uh, encouraging young people to go into okay. those engineering fields. Okay and in discouraging studies in the humanities that okay. tend to bring out many of the things that you brought before us today. Okay. Um, as a college president for 14 years, I spent a lot of time promoting STEM, i.e. science, math, technology, engineering, because, of course, that's where so many job opportunities are for young people today, and our society has a great need. Almost any government report you look at will say that one of the real problems of the United States is that we're counting on so many international foreign-born people to occupy those crucial positions. So there is a need for that. But, as the gentleman say, just said, it should not be an either or. It should not be that people should not still focus on the humanities and the like. Uh, as a professor, as an administrator, there have been many instances where a young person will come to me and say they want to major in literature, foreign language, history for heaven's sakes, and their parents don't want them to. And my response is always, first of all, nobody loves you more than your parents. And so whatever my parent would say to me, I think I'd take very seriously, but... The humanities are so important. It helps us have an understanding of the world. Uh, and interestingly, at a lot of these industries, even engineering companies, sometimes the person in charge is not necessarily an engineer. It can still be someone from a humanities background. So if I were in the position of you, if I were in a position to encourage some young person, I would encourage him or her to read, to read, to read, and it doesn't matter what they read. I have my reading list and my biases, but if you told me young people should read any novels, science fiction, um, you know, uh, computer books, it doesn't matter. Reading stimulates, and young people need to write. I don't know about you all, it really concerns me these days with texting and um, uh, emails, especially with texting, that people will abbreviate, but a lot of abbreviations could go for a lot of other words. And I understand you should look at the context, but really in truth, a lot of young people don't know how to write, and the concept of rewriting something uh, is something that they would not know. I don't know whether, whether you're impressed with my speech or not. That's on... Yeah, I understand that. But if you think I just got up and gave that without going over it again and again and again and writing it out, you don't understand. That's what, that's what I have to do. I have to spend an awful lot of time just preparing to speak to anybody. And young people don't often know the value of investing in that manner. Dr. Wright, let me ask you because um, I don't know whether the Confederate monument okay. whole discussion and controversy is going on in in your community as well, but we do have a public art uh, commission here, and I know Tom is a part of that, and what is your um, okay. take on that okay. subject? You, you know what, um, first of all, one of the first comments that Councilwoman Hamilton said to me was that in reading my book on blacks in Louisville, I mentioned the influence of a number of ex-Confederates in the 1870s and so forth. And I can still remember saying, back when I was a young person living in Lexington, Kentucky, how can I get justice if I go into court and there's a Confederate statue sitting right outside? I used to say that. And I used to say, fortunately, I haven't gone to jail yet or anything like that. But I used to say, I don't know if I will get justice or just us. Check it out. And I used to say, I don't like 
what the symbols are. Okay, that said, one of the fascinating things about the history of the United States, check this out. Somewhere around a million men, north and south, died in the American, Rev in the American Civil War, okay? Somewhere close to a million people were injured and so on down the line. Abraham Lincoln said to them, put down your weapons and go home. That we're going to, Lincoln did not say, as is common in a civil war, at least everybody who was part of the leadership will swing, right? What do you think would have happened had the Americans lost the Civil War? What do you think would have happened to George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, all those folks? But Lincoln said, for the good of our country, we've got to somehow heal the wounds. In doing so, it has led to a very interesting, controversial, difficult situation where people on both sides see people who fought on either side in a certain light. Okay. In the world we live in today, as you know, there have been a lot of discussion about Confederate monuments and so forth. My university, Duke, took down the monuments that were on their campus. After all, Duke was created in the 1920s, so the monuments do not go back to the 1860s. On the Capitol grounds in Texas, there are probably five or six monuments put up in the early 1900s. I do not know when the monuments were put up here. I'm glad that communities are grappling with it. And if I were to discuss this issue with any of you one-on-one, -on -one, I promise you I will not, if you said something different than my view, call you a racist or anything. But here's what I believe. I have been to Berlin, Germany, and Germany X number of times. Germany refudiated what the Nazis stood for. You cannot wear a swastika in Germany. Am I making that up? You cannot do that. You cannot wave those. You do not see monuments to Adolf Hitler. But if you go to the museums of German history, you can spend two days learning and reading everything you could possibly want to about the Nazis and all of that. And in other words, they have said those kinds of things go in a museum where we give an interpretation of those. And what, and what I do understand, what we interpret in 2018, the folk in 2050 may see somewhat different and they're entitled to that. So personally, I think I side, as difficult as it is, with we've got to rethink these. But yet, let me show you this. I'm a historian. I try to often say, but let's be real clear about this. If you say we get rid of everything, then most black folk here in America need to change their names, right all? Jackson, uh, uh, slave name, Clay, so on. Right, bound to have been a slave name, and all of that. So what do we do as a society? Maybe some of these obvious symbols like the Confederate monuments, we do something. But then with these other things, we still grapple with as we've had since 1865. If you say the brother seems mushy on this, well, I think this is a difficult issue. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Coming this way. Judy. Thank you. Dr. Wright, thank you so much. Um, I live just down the road in a next door neighborhood, Portland. This church, Portland Missionary, had its roots and gave root to the Underground Railroad okay. Okay. as the northern boundary okay. over to Indiana. Okay, okay, yeah. And as I understand, it was because of the Black Masonic Lodge mm -hmm. here at this church and their uh, camp meetings okay. in what was the swamps of Shawnee Park mm -hmm. uh, that they could provide cover. Mm -hmm. What else can you tell me about the Black Masonic movement okay. Okay. and any relationship to white Masons okay. Okay. and how that all served 
okay. for the now, now, passage. My comments may be specific to what I know about Louisville or Lexington, and, it, and, and they may not apply to everywhere. What I know is that there was complete separation between the black and white Masons and paternal or organizations, but the ones that I'm familiar with, the blacks, like the whites, were into providing services for their members, first and foremost. Burial services was a very important one in all of them, but they also would do other things, and definitely when slavery existed and black Masonic um, both male and female organizations started, they would try to provide educational opportunities as well. If you look at some of the schools that are public schools, blacks who were in fraternal organizations would help do those kinds of things. So that's what they did. They, they probably were involved in community uplift, in racial solidarity, more as much as they were involved in trying to help someone flee from slavery or something like that do something like, like that. And what's fascinating about it, and if you broaden it, you take a place like Louisville by the year 1900, there are probably 200 different kinds of societies among African Americans and the like that are engaged in all sorts of, sorts of things like that. Uh, as far as I know, again, the ones that I know were not necessarily united with, they may have, been mirror, they may have mirrored the activities of the whites. I saw some. Yes, ma'am. Here it comes. What's the I just want to thank you for being here. I have to say that as a historian that was coming along a little bit after you published these books in grad school, if there are four or five scholars who have really influenced my work, you're one of them, and I'm honored to be here with you today. So thank you. Well, well thank you. I'd like to just ask a question vis-a-vis okay. -vis some of the um, work that you've done. Could you say a little bit more about, I mean, I've used that phrase, and I know, you know, Sherry, you used it. Many of us have picked up your phrase of the polite racism yeah, yeah. in Louisville. But could you say okay. a little bit more okay. about that? Okay, just, sure, sure. Yeah, and, and if that's compared to the rest of Kentucky, or okay. is it compared to the rest of the South or the nation? Okay. Thank you. Okay. I, I started off by, well, I, I don't know if I made the point here or not. When I was growing up, I would hear people say all the time, if you complained about some race issue in Louisville, Lexington, or Kentucky, they say you ought to thank God that you don't live in Birmingham or somewhere like that. And it is true that you saw these horrendous acts that were going on in a Birmingham, but not in a Louisville. And so, so right there you said, huh, there must be a difference. And so what I was able to discover is that after slavery ended in Louisville, Lexington, and various places, it, it, this is even true to a certain extent in Alabama, there were some close connections that did occur. I can give you, I give examples in my book, a man named Wim H. Stewart, uh, uh, who was a letter carrier originally, and then he's involved in a number of other things. They had close relationships with whites, and what that did was that they helped maintain some of the worst aspects of racism. That's not a bad thing. But I try to point out that if you think about it, it can lull you into thinking that things are not as bad as they are. Do you know the absence of violence does not mean that everything is okay? Uh, I will tell anyone, in all of the white schools that I ever attended, starting ninth grade all the way through graduate school, no one ever called me the N-word, not one time. Does that mean that there were no racial problems at those schools? No. That doesn't, that doesn't mean, I mean, it's good not to be taunted like that. But sometimes it can be as long as you accept the status quo, uh, that it could then mean that people will then accommodate themselves. And that's what seems to have been the case here. I, by my definition, by the time I finished my book on Louisville, 
I said some places like Birmingham, Atlanta, other places, and there are a number of factors, they seem to have pro progressed beyond Louisville. Maybe sometimes the confrontational or some of the other things made people realize they could not deny themselves. Or, or let me give you another example that's totally different. All right, I become a university professor in 1977. During a time when predominantly white universities like the University of Kentucky are trying to find black professors, people went out of their way to really give me the pet on the back to encourage and so forth. Guess what? At the very same time I'm being hired, they're also hiring women in greater numbers than ever, including white women. You could document the discrimination that black people had faced and had been completely excluded. That was not the case for women. But women, too, had been discriminated against. And lo and behold, at the predominantly white universities where I was a professor, black people were able to make progress where women were stuck behind. It would have to be people like me who had been discriminated against who would have to stand up and say, women, too, have faced discrimination. It may be different, it may be subtle. They didn't call women all these names. They were married to these folk. But they denied them opportunities as well. That's a more polite, more subtle, more difficult way of doing it. In fact, you all, just think about this. And again, I try my best to stay out of current day politics. You all did not heard me say, I'm this, I'm that. A lot of times it was fascinating and folk will decide I'm this or that because I didn't say I was this or that. But one of the most telling things that I found, you know, November after the Clinton-Trump campaign was, let's say, two or three days after the election. And again, a lot of people are looking back. They went to Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and there were people in those states who said, I did not vote for Hillary Clinton simply because she was a woman. I said, no, don't vote for her because you don't like her politics. Don't vote for her for this. I was shocked. Terry would say I'm naive. Why was I shocked? That there were folk who said they would not vote for a woman, period, in that regard. Well, that to me is a more subtle form of discrimination than blacks had often faced. Yes, sir. Yes, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for your work and your books. I had the good fortune to run up to them some years ago. And they're just amazing in their detail and their, and their work. So thank you for your commitment to this. I want to ask you about reparations. I've had conversations with friends and Byron and others on the general subject. and. My, my general notion is that even if you could tally up the bill, you couldn't pay for it. Okay. Okay. But it might be intelligent to teach it so that you okay. would have a grasp okay. of, of what they did. Oh, that, 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 he's got it tough. This is rough. All right. Civil War ends 1865. A group of blacks petitioned Congress, and they said, we are entitled for our years of service something. And they said at the very least, 40 acres and a mule, right on? They said, come on, we got, you got to give us something. You gave us freedom and that's all? All right, I'm an undergraduate at the University of Kentucky, freshman. Some black economists had done a study and they said, that in current U.S. dollars, 1968, the United States government owed black people collectively $30 billion. I jumped up and down. I said, this is incredible. I'm going to get my money. Lord, I'm, this is, I, I don't know what to say. This is exciting. We do know very seriously now that almost every university that started during the colonial period benefited from slavery, those Ivy League schools. You see, the, if, if you want to think about this, in 1865, the South could say to the North, you are a hypocrite. You got everything you wanted out of slavery, now you want to end slavery. We still want to get out of it what you got out of it in that regard. So Northern 
institutions, just like Southern institutions, benefited from it. You do know Germany and Japan paid reparations, right on? That um, Mercedes Benz and companies like that used Jewish slave labor during the Second World War. They've paid reparations. Okay. I've said all that to say that it's a very, very complicated issue. See, here's one of the challenges right there. By the end of the Civil War, one out of every six people that we called a Negro had been fathered by someone white. There are some 400,000 free black people. There were black people who fought on the Confederate side during the Civil War. So this stuff gets complicated, you all. And so how do you make the distinctions? But check this out. Check this out. 1968, April the 4th, what happened? April the 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Okay. I'm a senior in high school in Lexington, Kentucky. Okay? I had done very poorly. To say, what's worse than poorly uh, in high school? Um, for my 25th high school graduation, Lafayette's class of 1968 named their scholarship the George C. Wright Class of 1968 Scholarship. Okay. I go back for the program a day or two earlier and I get a copy of my high school transcript. Now, I apologize. My number may be off a little bit, okay? If there were 550 people who graduated in my high school class, I graduated about 510 out of 550, okay? Made no A's in high school. Made a few B's, but every time I made a B, I made a D to balance it off <laughs> in that regard, okay? Now, why did I do so poorly in high school? My father had become an alcoholic, maybe this is an excuse, and had abandoned my mother and six kids. My first day at Lafayette High School, I was informed that I qualified for free lunch. They had a free lunch line and the other four lines, and I don't know what it was about me, I couldn't go through the free lunch line. So if you look at my transcript, it doesn't say this. Every day I didn't have lunch money, I didn't go to school. That made sense to me, right? I just couldn't go to school. April the 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King dies. A couple of weeks after that, the University of Kentucky, Indiana University, North Carolina University, Ohio State, about 20 universities said that they were gonna have a special program for Negro graduates of 1968. Can you believe that? I went over there and they said, if you came to this program for eight weeks and took simulated college classes, they would give you a Martin Luther King scholarship. And I said, wait a minute, there's got to be a catch because I knew I had a scholarship that Uncle Sam was going to give me to a place called Vietnam, right on? <laughs> They're not saying they'd do this. So I go and I sign up. So parenthetically, check this out. At the, the next day I go back and they say, everybody can leave but George Wright. And I said, gosh, what's wrong? And they said, we looked at your grades. You don't belong here. We didn't mean you. But I tried to explain it to them. They said I could stay. In part, I wanted to stay because I saw a young woman sitting up front who I started dating, and I married her at the start of my second year at UK. Okay. But guess what? UK gave me that scholarship for four years because I maintained a B average. UK then gave me money for my master's degree. My professors at, I told my professors at UK, I want to teach at UK. They said, well, if you want to teach at UK, you probably shouldn't get your PhD from UK. They helped me go to Duke. And here's what Duke said. We're going to give you a scholarship, they call it a fellowship, for three years. Now, do any of you all have any kids at Duke or something like that today? It costs about 80000 something like that. 
cost the same in 1974. Duke said they would give me money for three years. But then they said, but it takes four years to get a Duke PhD. I said, Lord, a brother can't get a break. This is rough. So guess what happened? I got a PhD from Duke in three years. You're right. If I'm sane, I will never tell anyone I was Duke's smartest, but I will tell them, at least in the history department, I was Duke's quickest, and I was Duke's first in that regard. I thought about all of that in response to this gentleman's question, um, that there are some of us who really have benefited in a way that other people have not benefited in American society. I have a brother five years younger than me, a brother 12 years younger than me, a sister over there 13 years younger than me. Those programs were not there when they came along. A window existed, and I somehow hit it through that window. So I got a reparation in that regard. I don't know how you make sense of it. And then here's the problem today in America. We not only have these black folk, but we got these poor folk who are white and Appalachia and various cities and so forth. Then we got all these folk who've come to America from other places more recently than, than some of the rest of us who need the same things. So I would argue that we've got to have something that not only benefits African Americans, but got to benefit everybody in that regard. So again, it's a real difficult issue. Dr. Wright, I had the pleasure of meeting you when I worked at the archives when you were researching some of your books, and I've just got two quick questions. Okay. Uh, how did we get so gray? Yes, sir. All these years. Okay. And the other thing is, I'm doing research on uh, the Bowman riots in Louisville in 1887, okay. which a mob, some said was 10,000 strong, okay. uh, attempted to lynch two African Americans being held in the jail. That's right. Were there any lynchings in okay. Louisville That's during good. Jim Crow? That's good. Okay. Or, first, the second question first. As I mentioned, when I started my research for racial violence, I could not find a lynching in Louisville or Lexington, and I even believe Frankfurt. I may be wrong on Frankfurt, but I, but I would say in the cities of Kentucky, I saw no examples of lynching. There were examples in Louisville and Lexington of where whites stormed the jails and they were actually shot that they would not turn over their prisoners. Yet I did say in those very same cities, there were these legal lynchings. But I saw no lynchings in the, the concept of what we talk about of where a mob takes it upon themselves there. Uh, his first question, of course, was designed to be facetious. And I'll give a facetious answer back. And that is, if you want to avoid being gray, and beat down at a university, stay in the classroom. Lord have mercy. If you go and become an administrator, I tell folk, before I became a president, I was about 6'5", and had an afro and a beard. Look at me now. Yes, ma'am. Hello, sir, and greetings to you. I'm Deborah. Uh, I was there at UK with you when we were freshmen. Embry, yeah, MAP. MAP. Yeah, MAP, right. and I'm Dr. MAP now. Yes. And I write about the holistic nature of looking at everything together because mm -hmm. when we try to separate out what we do, mm -hmm. we leave out a lot. Mm -hmm. And in terms of education and families, what do you think that we need to learn right now okay. that's going to help us okay. to move beyond where we are? Okay. Education's tried policy. Okay. It hasn't worked. How do we begin to work on ourselves okay. so that we can make a difference with our families okay. and with our children in school, too? Okay. You know, again, an excellent question. And, and I hope I don't give too simplistic an answer. But as a person who's been a university pr a professor, but more recently a president and a provost, I discovered that at the universities that I've been affiliated with, the students who succeed, the students who do best, have an adult in their life. A lot of times they're, they're biological parents. Sometimes it's people who they have no biological connection to. 
But when students have somebody who calls them or comes and sees them and who says, how are you doing, or you can hang in there, or just think about a young person. Here's, here's a common problem at every university I've ever been affiliated with. A young person would say, I'm taking this class, and the professor talks funny. He or she is an international, and I cannot understand them. Well, that's probably true, but other people have passed that class as well. That you have to learn to listen to people. You've got to learn to do this. But in other words, a parent can help them in that regard. Students who don't succeed in general at the universities that I've been affiliated with, they don't have somebody who can help them maneuver through all of the things that a college student needs. My son, probably an example like a lot of other folk, when he started college, he had two parents who were college graduates, and you'd be surprised at all the things we had to do for him, including me be the good cop and my wife do the beat down on him after his freshman year in that regard, that they need that love, but they also need somebody doing the other thing. The, the other thing is, even though I've been the president of a public university that's far different in cost than Duke, college, to most people, is still extraordinarily expensive. I believe, and I should have said this as part of black history presentation, there comes a point where people like us who benefited from the changes in American society, we owe it to do something for other people. I am now at a phase where I have to give to those schools that I've been affiliated with. I have to give books, about, help buy books for young people or do other kinds of things. But guess what else happens? There are young people, you know, sometimes you want to scold the young person for a mistake that they've made. When I was president, a young woman came to me and said she was going to have to drop out because she didn't have money for babysitting. Now, am I going to spend time and say, well, how in the heck did you get pregnant four years ago? Or do I say, geez, how do we help this person get the babysitting money they need so they can then finish up this semester and become productive in that regard? But guess what else we have to do? This is amazing. When I was a president, I used to say to students, first day, I said, let's be clear about some things that you just cannot do in college. I'd say, you cannot do dope. I said, you all cannot smoke dope. And folk would look at me like I'm crazy, and I'd say, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to do it with you all now. I would say, this is true. My wife and I started at UK in 1968. In 1968 at UK, can you imagine what it was like at Berkeley and so forth? The moment they cut the lights out on any program, folk would light up. Lawrence Will could be there, and folk would, and all this stuff. I'm scared to death that I'm going to get arrested. So the moment the lights would go out and all this, my wife and I, we, my future wife, we would jump back. So I tell my students now that because I never smoked dope, I developed a gene that I can, in, I can detect when people are doing dope. So here's what I'd say to them. I'm going to turn around and close my eyes for five seconds, and I'm going to come back around and I'm going to point you all out. Folk would duck. <laughs> can you believe this? Folk would duck. But guess what? A former Prairie View student worked in President Obama's cab, um, um, for President Obama's advance team. And he came back to campus, and I asked him, how did he get the job? And among other things, he said they did background checks. And he said they went back to when people were 21. Did you hear what I said? They, they, they didn't say, I'm going to start at 35. They said 21. And if you had done any dope, you were out. So I told folk, number one, don't do drugs in college. Number two. I said, don't get into any more debt than you have to. When they send you those credit card things where, that were not solicited, treat it like Superman would treat kryptonite. Right on? Stay away. Y'all didn't get that. Treat it like 
a chicken would do when Colonel Sanders offered them a ride. Right? Don't do that. Don't do that. No, that doesn't make sense, right, all? Would you take a ride with Colonel Sanders if you were a chicken? I'm just trying to relate to young people. Try to get out of college without debt. And then the third thing I would tell them, listen to this. I would say, don't do it. What does that mean? Listen to that. I would tell them, don't have sex. Do you all know how many young women would go home from every university I've been affiliated with? And while it is true, just because you have a baby doesn't mean you can't graduate from college, but it has to make it a little bit more challenging to graduate from college. And I tell folk, unashamedly, I dated my wife my freshman year. Start of my sophomore year, I went to her and I said, you got a choice. We either get married or we break up. Decide. She said, well, let's get married. We got married. That's what I tell them. Break up or get married. You see, you got to get out of college. If you can become 23 years old, no criminal record, no debt, no children, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. Can you imagine that? You can do whatever you want to do. So that's what I would say. But the bottom line, they got to have an adult, I think, helping them along the way. In my case, I had a mama and a minister. I had those two folk as anchors in my life. Okay? All right, thank you very much. Um, two things. I want to make a statement on Kentucky being kinder. Okay. Slaves, uh, Gwen and I from Newburgh, okay. and the Colonel Hike was nursed back to help by my great great aunt he was dying she nursed him back to help i'm told that he gave her the back part of his plantation which is newburgh so that's a slave being kind but also a slave master being kind so i thought about that uh my question is what effect your research shows that history of african-american have on us killing and shooting one another what's that effect and uh, does it have any influence on uh, our genocide and what can we do to correct it? First of all, uh, one of the fascinating things that makes the whole debate over slavery such an interesting one, a complicated one, is that almost anything anybody says to you about slavery is probably true in some instance. There are no question that there were acts of kindness on both sides of slavery. I mean, that, that, that is human nature. But please bear in mind what the most, perhaps the most famous slave said. Frederick Douglass was asked, were, was, your, was slavery kind or harsh, or mild or harsh? And Frederick Douglass said, that's a moot question. He said, if a slave has a mean master, he desires a good master. If a slave has a good master, he desires to be his own master. He says, under no circumstances in a country built on freedom do people want to be slaves. So, so I don't doubt that there were not acts, and I can give you acts of kindness that existed. Interestingly, I can also show you some of the most horrendous acts that black slave owners did to slaves. You see? So slavery's got everything that one can imagine in it, but make no mistake about the mere fact of somebody else owning your body and all of your labor in that regard. I suspect there are some of you in here who are involved in the criminal justice system and other things who might have some solutions or, or some suggestions on why crime is what it is in American society and why this crime happen, let's say black on black crime specifically or something like that. I guess one answer is that most crime that occurs anywhere is within a group, not outside of a group. So in other words, more whites commit crimes on whites than blacks commit crimes on whites and, and just like that. And so that may be part of the problem right there. But then again, and I realize there are a lot of answers that can happen, if you look at the number of people in our society now who come from backgrounds where there might not be two parents in the home, 
that those kinds of things can be involved. I'm, I don't know anything at all about this church that I'm in, so I cannot criticize, and, and all I can do, I'm going to assume, first of all, they open their doors to us, so I'm going to assume positive things about them, but I do know during the time period of my books on, on race relations in Kentucky that the community did more to help than, than may be the case now. Maybe people knew each other's more. You know, you know what? I guarantee you I'm not romanticizing when I talk about what it was like to go to all black schools. I will tell anyone that Douglas Elementary School, Booger T. Washington Elementary School that I attended did not have the facilities of their counterparts in the white schools. But the teachers were equally, if not better, and I'm not romanticizing train, because a lot of them had masters and advanced degrees from northern white schools because they could not go to the University of Kentucky or the University of Louisville, and because of the restricted job market, teaching was often all they could get even though they had master's degrees. So the teachers were well qualified, but the fact that these folk would also say things to us that would be part of this overall learning outside of the classroom. Uh, in response uh, 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 to Sister Deborah's comments, the things I say to the folk at the university, don't do drugs, uh, don't do credit card things, don't have sex, even if you all say it as naive, that's what I say to folk, are designed, those are outside of the classroom, just like people said things to me. But I think those are some of the challenges and and I then will turn one up without knowing anything about Louisville okay today I do know that state legislators in Texas have said that disproportionately in our schools we punish minority kids and they end up getting criminal records for things that they should not get I, I, again I can't talk about Kentucky but guess what? I have, when in Houston where I live, true story, they will say they have a one strike and you're out policy. And I've seen that be applied to black kids and Hispanic kids. But I've seen instances of where white kids accidentally left a knife in their car after hunting just like black kids. They said, but he's going to West Point next year. We can't mess that up with him. And I'm okay with not messing it up with him, but what about these other folk? So surely some aspect of crime might be that. In other words, if you read my books closely, my book on racial violence, I say if a black person has truly done the crime, the system will treat him maybe fairly, no question, harshly. But if a white person has done it, I said, they come up with a word called leniency. And I've always said, I told you, I don't like the idea of that Confederate soldier sitting out front. I've also said, if I go to court, I'm going to say, treat me like I'm white. Give me leniency. Right. Is what I have said. And on that note, <laughs> this was a great community conversation. I mean, we could go on for another hour, but we only had him for about two hours. So I know he's going to have to get back on the road. At this time, I'd like to call on Kelly Watson from the mayor's office to, for a presentation. And a little birdie had told me it was your birthday. I forgot to say happy birthday to you. Thank you so much. Let's give him a hand. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Uh, for allowing me to be here on behalf of our mayor, Greg Fisher, and thank you for this wonderful community conversation. Um, and hopefully um, we won't be able to have programs just like this just during Black History Month, but throughout the year, um, learning about our history is very important for all the reasons that uh, Dr. Wright spoke of today. And so throughout this year, and really, really uh, very soon, uh, Mayor Fisher will be announcing that we'll be having pretty uh, soon, uh, lots of community conversations about our history and bringing us together to have um, conversations so that we can bring, each, bring together and learn more about each other and um, be able to have some respect and learn about each other's differences. So um, actually at this moment, I'd like to bring you back up 
and present this proclamation to you. Um, this proclamation states that um, to all whom these presents shall come, greetings uh, to you, uh, Dr. George Bright, for sharing the history of African Americans Louisville so that we may be challenged to become better educated and more committed to building a more equitable future for all. As a faculty member and administrator at schools throughout our community, Dr. Wright has helped countless people learn from our past, including the insights he shares in his li uh, Life Behind a Veil. Our city thanks Dr. Wright for sharing his passion, commitment, and deep knowledge. Thank you.